Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. This evening, let's relax with some science and return to the Principles of Chemistry by Dmitry Mendeleev, translated from the Russian by George Kamensky, ARSM, of the Imperial Mint St. Petersburg, member of the Russian Physico-Chemical Society, edited by T.A. Lawson, B.S.C., Ph.D., examiner in coal tar products to the City and Guilds of London, Institute Fellow of the Institute of Chemistry. Published in two volumes in 1897 by Longman's Green and Co., 39 Paternoster Row, London. Let's pick up where we left off in Mendeleev's very lengthy introduction to the principles of chemistry. Accepting the truth of the law of the indestructibility of matter the question naturally arises as to whether there is any limit to the various chemical transformations, or are they unrestricted in number? That is to say, is it possible from a given substance to obtain an equivalent quantity of any other substance? In other words, does there exist a perpetual and infinite change of one kind of material into every other kind, or is the cycle of these transformations limited? This is the second essential problem of chemistry, a question of quality of matter, and one, it is evident, which is more complicated than the question of quantity. It cannot be solved by a mere superficial glance at the subject. Indeed, on seeing how all the varied forms and colors of plants are built up from air and the elements of the soil, and how metallic iron can be transformed into colors such as inks and Prussian blue, we might be led to think that there is no end to the qualitative changes to which matter is susceptible. But on the other hand, the experiences of everyday life compel us to acknowledge that food cannot be made out of a stone or gold out of copper. Thus, a definite answer can only be looked for in a close and diligent study of the subject, and the problem has been resolved in different ways at different times. In ancient times, the opinion most generally held was that everything visible was composed of four elements, air, water, earth, and fire. The origin of this doctrine can be traced far back into the confines of Asia, whence it was handed down to the Greeks, and most fully expounded by Empedocles, who lived before 460 BC. This doctrine was not the result of exact research, but apparently owes its origin to the clear division of bodies into gases like air, liquids like water, and solids like the earth. The Arabs appear to have been the first who attempted to solve the question by experimental methods and they introduced, through Spain, the taste for the study of similar problems into Europe, where from that time there appear many adepts in chemistry, which was considered as an unholy art and called alchemy. As the alchemists were ignorant of any exact law which could guide them in their researches, they obtained most anomalous results. 
Their chief service to chemistry was that they made a number of experiments and discovered many new chemical transformations. But it is well known how they solved the fundamental problem of chemistry. Their view may be taken as a positive acknowledgement of the infinite transmutability of matter, for they aimed at discovering the Philosopher's Stone, capable of converting everything into gold and diamonds, and of making the old young again. This solution of the question was afterwards completely overthrown, but it must not, for this reason, be thought that the hopes held by the alchemists were only the fruit of their imaginations. The first chemical experiments might well lead them to their conclusions. They took, for instance, the bright metallic mineral galena and extracted metallic lead from it. Thus they saw that from a metallic substance which is unfitted for use, they could obtain another metallic substance which is ductile and valuable for many technical purposes. Furthermore, they took this lead and obtained silver, a still more valuable metal from it. Thus they might easily conclude that it was possible to ennoble metals by means of a whole series of transmutations, that is to say, to obtain from them those which are more and more precious. Having got silver from lead, they assumed that it would be possible to obtain gold from silver. The mistake they made was that they never weighed or measured the substances used or produced in their experiments. Had they done so, they would have learnt that the weight of the lead was much less than that of the galena from which it was obtained and the weight of the silver infinitesimal compared with that of the lead. Had they looked more closely into the process of the extraction of the silver from lead, and silver at the present time is chiefly obtained from the lead ores, they would have seen that the lead does not change into silver, but that it only contains a certain small quantity of it and this amount having once been separated from the lead, it cannot by any further operation give more. The silver which the alchemists extracted from the lead was in the lead, and was not obtained by a chemical change of the lead itself. This is now well known from experiment, but the first view of the nature of the process was very likely to be an erroneous one. The methods of research adopted by the alchemists could give but little success, for they did not set themselves clear and simple questions, whose answers would aid them to make further progress. Thus, though they did not arrive at any exact law, they left nevertheless numerous and useful experimental data as an inheritance to chemistry. They investigated in particular the transformations proper to metals, and for this reason chemistry was for long afterwards entirely confined to the study of metallic substances. In their researches, the alchemists frequently made use of two chemical processes which are now termed reduction and oxidation. The rusting of metals, and in general their conversion from a metallic into an earthy form, is called oxidation, whilst the extraction of a metal from an earthy substance is called reduction. Many metals, for instance iron, lead, and tin, are oxidized by heating in air alone and may be again reduced by heating with carbon. Such oxidized metals are found in the earth and form the majority of metallic ores. The metals, such as tin, iron, and copper, may be extracted from these ores by heating them together with carbon. 
All these processes were well studied by the alchemists. It was afterwards shown that all earths and minerals are formed of similar metallic rusts or oxides or of their combinations. Thus, the alchemists knew of two forms of chemical changes, the oxidation of metals and the reduction of the oxides so formed into metals. The explanation of the nature of these two classes of chemical phenomena was the means for the discovery of the most important chemical laws. The first hypothesis on their nature is due to Becker, and more particularly to Stahl, a surgeon to the King of Prussia. Stahl writes in his Fundamenta Chimiae, 1723, that all substances consist of an imponderable fiery substance called phlogiston, materia aut principium ignis non ipse ignis, and of another element having particular properties for each substance. The greater the capacity of a body for oxidation, or the more combustible it is, the richer it is in phlogiston. Carbon contains it in great abundance. In oxidation or combustion, phlogiston is emitted, and in reduction it is consumed or enters into combination. Carbon reduces earthy substances because it is rich in phlogiston and gives up a portion of its phlogiston to the substance reduced. Thus, Stahl supposed metals to be compound substances consisting of phlogiston and an earthy substance or oxide. This hypothesis is distinguished for its very great simplicity, and for this and other reasons, it acquired many supporters. Lavoisier proved by means of the balance that every case of rusting of metals or oxidation or of combustion is accompanied by an increase in weight at the expense of the atmosphere. He formed, therefore, the natural opinion that the heavier substance is more complex than the lighter one. Lavoisier's celebrated experiment, made in 1774, gave indubitable support to his opinion, which in many respects was contradictory to Stahl's doctrine. Lavoisier poured four ounces of pure mercury into a glass retort, as shown in figure three, whose neck was bent as shown in the drawing, and dipped into the vessel R.S., also full of mercury. The projecting end of the neck was covered with a glass bell jar, P. The weight of all the mercury taken, and the volume of air remaining in the apparatus, namely that in the upper portion of the retort and under the bell jar, were determined before beginning the experiment. It was most important in this experiment to know the volume of air in order to learn what part it played in the oxidation of the mercury, because according to Stahl, phlogiston is emitted into the air, whilst according to Lavoisier, the mercury in oxidizing absorbs a portion of the air, and consequently it was absolutely necessary to determine whether the amount of air increased or decreased in the oxidation of the metal. It was, therefore, most important to measure the volume of the air in the apparatus, both before and after the experiment. For this purpose, it was necessary to know the total capacity of the retort, the volume of the mercury poured into it, the volume of the bell jar above the level of the mercury, and also the temperature and pressure of the air at the time of its measurement. The volume of air contained in the apparatus and isolated from the surrounding atmosphere could be determined from these data. Having arranged his apparatus in this manner, Lavoisier heated the retort, 
holding the mercury for a period of 12 days at a temperature near the boiling point of mercury. The mercury became covered with a quantity of small red scales, that is, it was oxidized or converted into an earth. This substance is the same mercury oxide which has already been mentioned in example 3. After the lapse of 12 days, the apparatus was cooled, and it was then seen that the volume of the air in the apparatus had diminished during the time of the experiment. This result was in exact contradiction to Stahl's hypothesis. Out of 50 cubic inches of air originally taken, there only remained 42. Lavoisier's experiment led to other equally important results. The weight of the air taken decreased by as much as the weight of the mercury increased in oxidizing. That is, the portion of the air was not destroyed, but only combined with mercury. This portion of the air may be again separated from the mercury oxide, and has, as we saw in example 3, properties different from those of air. It is called oxygen. That portion of the air which remained in the apparatus and did not combine with the mercury does not oxidize metals and cannot support either combustion or respiration so that a lighted taper is immediately extinguished if it be dipped into the gas which remains in the jar. It is extinguished in the residual gas as if it had been plunged into water, writes Lavoisier in his memoir. This gas is called nitrogen. Thus, air is not a simple substance, but consists of two gases, oxygen and nitrogen, and therefore the opinion that air is an elementary substance is erroneous. The oxygen of the air is absorbed in combustion and the oxidation of metals, and the earths produced by the oxidation of metals are substances composed of oxygen and a metal. By mixing the oxygen with the nitrogen, the same air as was originally taken is reformed. It has also been shown by direct experiment that on reducing an oxide with carbon, the oxygen contained in the oxide is transferred to the carbon and gives the same gas that is obtained by the combustion of carbon in air. Therefore, this gas is a compound of carbon and oxygen, just as the earthy oxides are composed of metals and oxygen. The many examples of the formation and decomposition of substances which are met with convince us that the majority of substances with which we have to deal are compounds made up of several other substances. By heating chalk, or else copper carbonate, as in the second example, we obtain lime, and the same carbonic acid gas which is produced by the combustion of carbon. On bringing lime into contact with this gas and water at an ordinary temperature, we again obtain the compound, carbonate of lime, or chalk. Therefore, chalk is a compound. So also are those substances from which it may be built up. Carbonic anhydride is formed by the combination of carbon and oxygen and lime is produced by the oxidation of a certain metal called calcium. By resolving substances in this manner into their component parts, we arrive at last at such as are indivisible into two or more substances by any means whatever, and which cannot be formed from other substances. All we can do is to make such substances combine together to act on other substances. 
Substances which cannot be formed from or decomposed into others are termed simple substances or elements. Thus, all homogeneous substances may be classified into simple and compound substances. This view was introduced and established as a scientific fact during the lifetime of Lavoisier. The number of these elements is very small in comparison with the number of compound substances which are formed by them. At the present time, only 70 elements are known with certainty to exist. Some of them are very rarely met with in nature, or are found in very small quantities, whilst the existence of others is still doubtful. The number of elements with whose compounds we commonly deal in everyday life is very small. Elements cannot be transmuted into one another. At least up to the present, not a single case of such a transformation has been met with. It may therefore be said that, as yet, it is impossible to transmute one metal into another. And as yet, notwithstanding the number of attempts which have been made in this direction, no fact has been discovered which could in any way support the idea of the complexity of such well-known elements as oxygen, iron, sulfur, etc. Therefore, from its very conception, an element is not susceptible to reactions of decomposition. The quantity, therefore, of each element remains constant in all chemical changes, a fact which may be deduced as a consequence of the law of the indestructibility of matter and of the conception of elements themselves. Thus the equation expressing the law of the indestructibility of matter acquires a new and still more important signification. If we know the quantities of the elements which occur in the reacting substances, and if from these substances there proceed, by means of chemical changes, a series of new compound substances, then the latter will together contain the same quantity of each of the elements as there originally existed in the reacting substances. The essence of chemical change is embraced in the study of how and with what substances each element is combined before and after change. In order to be able to express various chemical changes by equations, it has been agreed to represent each element by the first or some two letters of its Latin name. Thus, for example, oxygen is represented by the letter O, nitrogen by N, mercury or hydrogyrum by HG, iron or ferrum by Fe, and so on for all the elements, as is seen in the tables on page 24. A compound substance is represented by placing the symbols representing the elements of which it is made up side by side. For example, Red mercury oxide is represented by HgO, which shows that it is composed of oxygen and mercury. Besides this, the symbol of every element corresponds with a certain relative quantity of it by weight, called its combining weight, or the weight of an atom, so that the chemical formula of a compound substance not only designates the nature of the elements of which it is composed, but also their quantitative proportion. Every chemical process may be expressed by an equation composed of the formulae corresponding with those substances which take part in it and are produced by it. The amount by weight of the elements in every chemical equation must be equal on both sides of the equation, 
since no element is either formed or destroyed in a chemical change. On the following pages, a list of the elements with their symbols and combining or atomic weights is given, and we shall see afterwards on what basis the atomic weights of elements are determined. At present, we will only point out that a compound containing the elements A and B is designated by the formula ANBM, where M and N are the coefficients or multiples in which the combining weights of the elements enter into the composition of the substance. If we represent the combining weight of the substance capital A by lowercase a, and that of the substance capital B by lowercase b, then the composition of the substance ANBM will be expressed thus. It contains Na parts by weight of the substance capital A and Mb parts by weight of the substance capital B, and consequently 100 parts of our compound contain Na100 over Na plus Mb percentage parts by weight of the substance capital A and Mb100 over Na plus Mb of the substance capital B. It is evident that as a formula shows the relative amounts of all the elements contained in a compound, the actual weights of the elements contained in a given weight of a compound may be calculated from its formula. For example, the formula NaCl of table salt shows as Na equals 23 and Cl equals 35.5 that 58.5 pounds of salt contain 23 pounds of sodium and 35.5 pounds of chlorine and that 100 parts of it contain 39.3% of sodium and 60.7% of chlorine. What has been said above clearly limits the province of chemical changes, because from substances of a given kind, there can be obtained only such as contain the same elements. Even with this limitation, however, the number of possible combinations is infinitely great. Only a comparatively small number of compounds have yet been described or subjected to research, and anyone working in this direction may easily discover new compounds which had not before been obtained. It often happens, however, that such newly discovered compounds were foreseen by chemistry whose object is the apprehension of that uniformity which rules over the multitude of compound substances, and whose aim is the comprehension of those laws which govern their formation and properties. The conception of elements having been established, the next objects of chemistry were the determination of the properties of compound substances, on the basis of the determination of the quantity and kind of elements of which they are composed, the investigation of the elements themselves, the determination of what compound substances can be formed from each element and the properties which these compounds show, and the apprehension of the nature of the connection between the elements in different compounds. An element thus serves as the starting point and is taken as the primary conception on which all other substances are built up. When we state that a certain element enters into the composition of a given compound, when we say, for instance, that mercury oxide contains oxygen, we do not mean that it contains oxygen as a gaseous substance but only desire to express those transformations which mercury oxide is capable of making. 
That is, we wish to say that it is possible to obtain oxygen from mercury oxide and that it can give up oxygen to various other substances. In a word, we desire only to express those transformations of which mercury oxide is capable. Or, more concisely, it may be said that the composition of a compound is the expression of those transformations of which it is capable. It is useful in this sense to make a clear distinction between the conception of an element as a separate homogeneous substance and as a material but invisible part of a compound. Mercury oxide does not contain two simple bodies, a gas and a metal, but two elements, mercury and oxygen, which, when free, are a gas and a metal. Neither mercury as a metal nor oxygen as a gas is contained in mercury oxide. It only contains the substance of these elements, just as steam only contains the substance of ice, but not ice itself, or as corn contains the substance of the seed, but not the seed itself. The existence of an element may be recognized without knowing it in the uncombined state, but only from an investigation of its combinations, and from the knowledge that it gives, under all possible conditions, substances which are unlike other known combinations of substances. Fluorine is an example of this kind. It was for a long time unknown in a free state, and nevertheless was recognized as an element because its combinations with other elements were known, and their difference from all other similar compound substances was determined. In order to grasp the difference between the conception of the visible form of an element as we know it in the free state, and of the intrinsic element, or radical, as Lavoisier called it, contained in the visible form, it should be remarked that compound substances also combine together, forming yet more complex compounds, and that they evolve heat in the process of combination. The original compound may often be extracted from these new compounds by exactly the same methods as elements are extracted from their corresponding combinations. Besides, many elements exist under various visible forms, whilst the intrinsic element contained in these various forms is something which is not subject to change. Thus, carbon appears as charcoal, graphite, and diamond, but yet the element carbon alone, contained in each, is one and the same. Carbonic anhydride contains carbon, and not charcoal, or graphite, or the diamond. Elements alone, although not all of them, have the peculiar luster, opacity, malleability, and the great heat and electrical conductivity which are proper to metals and their mutual combinations. But elements are far from all being metals. Those which do not possess the physical properties of metals are called non-metals or metalloids. It is, however, impossible to draw a strict line of demarcation between metals and non-metals there being many intermediary substances. Thus graphite, from which pencils are manufactured, is an element with the luster and other properties of a metal, but charcoal and the diamond, which are composed of the same substance as graphite, do not show any metallic properties. Both classes of elements are clearly distinguished in definite examples. But in particular cases, the distinction is not clear and cannot serve as a basis for the exact division of the elements into two groups. The conception of elements forms the basis of chemical knowledge, and in giving a list of them at the very beginning of our work, 
we wish to tabulate our present knowledge of the subject. Although about 70 elements are now authentically known, but many of them are so rarely met with in nature and have been obtained in such small quantities that we possess but a very insufficient knowledge of them. The substances most widely distributed in nature contain a very small number of elements. These elements have been more completely studied than the others because a greater number of investigators have been able to carry on experiments and observations on them. The elements most widely distributed in nature are Hydrogen, symbol H, number 1, in water and in animal and vegetable organisms. Carbon, symbol C, number 12, in organisms coal and limestones. Nitrogen, symbol N, number 14, in air and in organisms. Oxygen, symbol O, number 16, in air, water, and earth. It forms the greater part of the mass of the earth. Sodium, symbol Na, number 23, in common salt and in many minerals. Magnesium, symbol Mg, number 24, in seawater and in many minerals. Aluminum, symbol Al, number 27, in minerals and clay. Silicon, symbol Si, number 28, in sand, minerals, and clay. Phosphorus, symbol P, number 31, in bones, ashes of plants, and soil. Sulfur, symbol S, number 32, in pyrites, gypsum, and in seawater. Chlorine, symbol CL, number 35.5, in common salt and in the salts of seawater. Potassium, symbol K, number 39, in minerals, ashes of plants, and in nitre. Calcium, symbol CA, number 40, in limestones, gypsum, and in organisms. Iron, symbol FE, number 56, in the earth, iron ores, and in organisms. Besides these, the following elements, although not very largely distributed in nature, are all more or less well known from their applications to the requirements of everyday life or the arts, either in a free state or in their compounds. Lithium, symbol Li, number 7, in medicine, Li2CO3, and in photography, LIBR. Boron, symbol B, number 11, as borax, B4, Na2O7, and as boric anhydride, B2O3. Fluorine, symbol F, number 19, as fluor spar, CaF2, and as hydrofluoric acid, HF. Chromium, symbol CR, number 52, as chromic anhydride, CrO3, and potassium dichromate, K2, Cr2, O7. Manganese, symbol Mn, number 55, as manganese peroxide, MnO2, and potassium permanganate, MnKO4. Cobalt, Symbol CO, number 59.5, in smalt and blue glass. 
Nickel, symbol NI, number 59.5, for electroplating other metals. Copper, symbol CU, number 63, the well-known red metal. Zinc, symbol ZN, number 65, used for the plates of batteries, roofing, etc. Arsenic, symbol AS, number 75, white arsenic, a poison, AS203. Bromine, symbol BR, number 80, a brown volatile liquid, sodium bromide, NABR. Strontium, symbol SR, number 87, in colored fires, SRN206. Silver, symbol AG, number 109, the well-known white metal. Cadmium, symbol CD, number 112, in alloys and yellow paint, CDS. Tin, symbol SN, number 119, the well-known metal. Antimony, symbol SB, number 120, in alloys such as type metal. Iodine, symbol I, number 127, in medicine and photography, free and as KI. Barium, symbol BA, number 137, permanent white and as an adulterant in white lead and in heavy spar, BASO4. Platinum, symbol PT, number 196. Gold, symbol AU, number 197. Mercury, symbol HG, number 200. Lead, symbol PB, number 207. All well-known metals. Bismuth, symbol BI, number 209, in medicine and fusible alloys. Uranium, symbol U, number 239, in green fluorescent glass. The compounds of the following metals and semi-metals have fewer applications but are well known and are somewhat frequently met with in nature, although in small quantities. Beryllium, symbol BE, number 9. Titanium, symbol TI, number 48. Vanadium, symbol V, number 51. Selenium, symbol SE, number 79. Zirconium, symbol ZR, number 91. Molybdenum, symbol MO, number 96. Palladium, symbol PD, number 107. Cerium, symbol CE, number 140. Tungsten, symbol W, number 184. Osmium, Symbol OS, number 192. Iridium, symbol IR, number 193. Thallium, symbol TL, number 204. The following rare metals are still more seldom met with in nature, but have been studied somewhat fully. Scandium, symbol SC, number 44. Gallium, symbol GA, number 70. Yttrium, symbol Y, number 89. Niobium, symbol NB, number 94. Ruthenium, symbol RU, number 102. Rhodium, symbol RH, 
Number 103. Indium, symbol IN, number 114. Tellurium, symbol TE, number 125. Germanium, symbol GE, number 72. Rubidium, symbol RB, number 86. Cesium, symbol CS, number 133. Lanthanum, symbol LA, number 138. Didymium, symbol DI, number 142. Iterbium, symbol YB, number 173. Tantalum, symbol TA, number 183. Thorium, symbol TH, number 232. Besides these 66 elements, there have been discovered erbium, terbium, samarium, thulium, holmium, mosandrium, philippium, and several others, but their properties and combinations, owing to their extreme rarity, are very little known, and even their existence as independent substances is doubtful. It has been incontestably proved from observations on the spectra of the heavenly bodies that many of the commoner elements, such as helium, sodium, magnesium, and iron, occur on the far distant stars, this fact confirms the belief that those forms of matter which appear on the Earth as elements are widely distributed over the entire universe. But we do not yet know why, in nature, the mass of some elements should be greater than that of others. The capacity of each element to combine with one or another element and to form compounds with them which are in a greater or less degree prone to give new and yet more complex substances, forms the fundamental character of each element. The sulfur easily combines with the metals oxygen, chlorine, or carbon, whilst gold and silver enter into combinations with difficulty and form unstable compounds which are easily decomposed by heat. The cause or force which induces the elements to enter into chemical change must be considered, as also the cause which holds different substances in combination, that is, which induces the substances formed with their particular degree of stability. This cause or force is called affinity, or chemical affinity. Since this force must be regarded as exclusively an attractive force, like gravity, many writers, for instance Bergman at the end of the last and Bertolet at the beginning of this century, supposed affinity to be essentially similar to the universal force of gravity, from which it only differs in that the latter acts at observable distances whilst affinity only evinces itself at the smallest possible distances. But chemical affinity cannot be entirely identified with the universal attraction of gravity, which acts at appreciable distances and is dependent only on mass and distance, and not the quality of the material on which it acts, whilst it is by the quality of matter that affinity is most forcibly influenced Neither can it be entirely identified with cohesion, which gives to homogeneous solid substances their crystalline form, elasticity, hardness, ductility, and other properties, and to liquids their surface tension, drop formation, capillarity, and other properties because affinity acts between the component parts of a substance and cohesion on a substance in its homogeneity, although both act at imperceptible distances by contact and have much in common. 
chemical force which makes one substance penetrate into another cannot be entirely identified with even those attracting forces which make different substances adhere to each other or hold together as when two plain polished surfaces of solid substances are brought into close contact or which cause liquids to soak into solids or adhere to their surfaces or gases and vapors to condense on the surface of solids. These forces must not be confounded with chemical forces, which cause one substance to penetrate into the substance of another and to form a new substance, which is never the case with cohesion. But it is evident that the forces which determine cohesion form a connecting link between mechanical and chemical forces because they only act by intimate contact. For a long time, and especially during the first half of this century, chemical attraction and chemical forces were identified with electrical forces. There is certainly an intimate relation between them, for electricity is evolved in chemical reactions and has also a powerful influence on chemical processes. For instance, compounds are decomposed by the action of an electrical current, and the exactly similar relation which exists between chemical phenomena and the phenomena of heat, heat being developed by chemical phenomena, and heat being able to decompose compounds only proves the unity of the forces of nature, the capability of one force to produce and to be transformed into others. For this reason, the identification of chemical force with electricity will not bear experimental proof. As of all the molecular phenomena of nature which act on substances at immeasurably small distances, the phenomena of heat are at present the best comparatively known, having been reduced to the simplest fundamental principles of mechanics. Of energy, equilibrium, and movement, which since Newton have been subjected to strict mathematical analysis, it is quite natural that an effort which has been particularly pronounced during recent years should have been made to bring chemical phenomena into strict correlation with the already investigated phenomena of heat, without, however, aiming at any identification of chemical with heat phenomena. The true nature of chemical force is still a secret to us just as is the nature of the universal force of gravity, and yet without knowing what gravity really is, by applying mechanical conceptions, astronomical phenomena have been subjected not only to exact generalization, but to the detailed prediction of a number of particular facts. And so also, Although the true nature of chemical affinity may be unknown, there is reason to hope for considerable progress in chemical science by applying the laws of mechanics to chemical phenomena by means of the mechanical theory of heat. As yet, this portion of chemistry has been but little worked at, and therefore, while forming a current problem of the science, it is treated more fully in that particular field, which is termed either theoretical or physical chemistry, or more correctly, chemical mechanics. As this province of chemistry requires a knowledge not only of the various homogeneous substances which have yet been obtained, and of the chemical transformations which they undergo, but also of the phenomena of heat and other kinds by which these transformations are accompanied, it is only possible to enter on the study of chemical mechanics after an acquaintance with the fundamental chemical conceptions and substances which form the subject of this book.
And that seems as good a place as any to end this evening's reading from The Principles of Chemistry by Dmitry Mendeleev. Once again, I think I learned more about chemistry in that hour of reading than I ever did in an entire year of high school chemistry, but it's never too late to learn. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. The description also includes ways you can support this podcast and keep it ad-free, including becoming a member of our Patreon or dropping a one-time tip via buymeacoffee.com. No subscription required. All podcast supporters in September will be entered into a raffle, the prize for which is a personal reading all your own. If you'd like to connect, the best place to do so is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.